Good morning, everybody. Well, after that gourmet coffee, I know you're all doing really well, so that, that helps. That shows that you really are great students, slugging coffee down before uh, you offer this talk up and get souls out of purgatory. Anyway, <laughs> I have a card. There's two holy cards on top of a little fireplace here. One of St. Killian, in case you don't know about Killian, I'd love to talk to you about him. Uh, and the other one is this beautiful image that John Paul had placed up in St. Peter's Square, our Lady Mother of the Church. And since what we're going to be talking about today, in many ways, folks, upon our church, I thought we would say the prayer that he composed. All right? So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mother of the Church, grant that the Church may enjoy freedom and peace in fulfilling her saving mission, and that to this end she may become mature with a new maturity of faith and inner unity. Help us to overcome opposition and difficulties. Help us to rediscover all the simplicity and dignity of the Christian vocation. Grant that there may be no lack of laborers in the Lord's vineyard. Sanctify families. Watch over the souls of the young and the hearts of children. Help us to overcome the great moral threats against the fundamental spheres of life and love. Obtain for us the grace to be continually renewed through all the beauty of witness given to the cross and resurrection of your Son. Amen. Our Lady Mother of the Church, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to be with you uh, today to speak on such an important and timely topic. But it's a topic, I think we talk about the kingship of Christ, that oftentimes is really misunderstood. Uh, sometimes it's neglected, and at other times it's denied. You know, but our present Holy Father, Pope Francis, like his predecessors, have all stated very clearly that we're in the midst of a very grave crisis. These are very difficult times. It's a crisis affecting faith in the church, and since it's affecting the faith in the church, the world also has been greatly affected by this crisis. But all of us as believing, committed Roman Catholics gathering here want to, to use the old Latin expression, sentire cum ecclesia. We want to think with the church, be men and women of the church. Now there are many in our world, and sadly many I think in our church today, who would raise objections against the very title of my talk, talking about quas primas, talking about the reign of Christ the King. For it would seem that, for one objection, to speak of a social reign, to speak of kingship and monarchy is simply outdated because we're living in an age of democracy, egalitarianism. Have you heard that lately? All right. The concept is hopelessly medieval in tone, so it should be dropped. Secondly, some will say such a term smacks of authoritarianism, which demands obedience in an age which extols freedom and diversity as the highest and the greatest goods. Third objection, does not the concept of a social reign of Christ smack of triumphalism, the type of triumphalism that the Second Vatican Council had rejected? Those are some of the objections, but let's give you a little said contra, all right? What does the voice of the church say? What does Holy Mother Church say, particularly when speaking through the Vicar of Christ? So what I'd like to start with this morning is sort of look back, because we want to look back in order to go forward. It's hard to go forward and chart a course forward if you're not looking back at where you came from. Like John Paul once said, a people that has no knowledge of its past has no future. And so that's what we want to take a close look at. At the dawn of the 20th century, Pope Leo XIII wrote an important encyclical that is preparatory for the one we're going to talk about today. That encyclical was Anum Sacrum. He said that encyclical was the greatest act of his pontificate. And he was the third longest reigning pope. Brilliant man, brilliant Thomas, but he said that document, Anum Sacrum, was the greatest act of his pontificate. In that document, he consecrated the entire human race to the sacred heart of Jesus. It was issued in 1899, right at the beginning of the 20th century. He begins his encyclical stating boldly 
that we all owe our allegiance, everyone, we all owe our allegiance to Jesus Christ as the supreme Lord, as the head of the human race. He reigns, first of all, he says, over all Catholic nations. He reigns, all Catholic nations. Secondly, he reigns, he says, over all duly washed in the waters of holy baptism. That is, all Christians, even if they're rejecting the pastoral care of the church, the fact that they are baptized Christians, okay, Christ reigns over them as well, even if they reject the church's pastoral care. But then he says also, over all who are deprived of the Christian faith, which means, therefore, Christ reigns over the entire human race. There are no exceptions to his reign. Now, why does the Pope say that? First of all, because Jesus Christ is divine. As we say in our creed, our Nicene Creed, every single Sunday, what do we say? He is the only begotten of the Father, consubstantial with him, God from God, light from light. He is true God from true God. And since he is God, he exercises a sovereign power over everything in the church, but also everything in the world. The Holy Father teaches us that Christ reigns in two ways. First, we've already kind of hinted at, all right, by natural right. Since he is the Son of God, as God, he has a natural right to reign over us. But secondly, he says, by an acquired right, an acquired right, since he gave himself for the redemption of all men. In other words, because of his suffering and death, he has acquired that right because of what he did. Right? He reigns, therefore, not only over Catholics, but all who have gotten <laughs> baptism, but all men, all human beings, individually and collectively. Now, he goes on to say, how does he reign? He reigns through truth. He reigns through justice. And very importantly for us, he reigns through charity. He reigns through love. And we're going to talk more about that later towards the end of the talk. The Holy Father then stated how pleasing our Lord would be if we all made this consecration voluntarily, entered into it. That would show our acceptance of his authority over us. So important. So this act of consecration, he ordered that the entire Catholic world would make that consecration on the same date. All right? And again, what's he say? If we make this consecration as a church, he said, first, it would help Roman Catholics to increase and strengthen their faith and love by an act of consecration. You're going to increase and strengthen your faith and love. Secondly, among Protestant Christians, it would increase the flame of charity. Isn't that interesting? Catholics praying and making an act of consecration is going to help our separated brothers and sisters grow in charity. And then he adds another thing. For the pagans, it will bring them closer to faith and holiness so that they might honor God as they ought and win everlasting happiness in heaven. Now, this is way before Vatican II. Isn't that interesting? Pagans will be affected. Why is he saying all this? Why? Christ is the Son of God. What's he doing in heaven? He is always making intercession for us, right? So by consecrating ourselves to him with an act of faith, an act of love, it helps everybody. Because through our intercession, Christ's intercession is also strengthened and activated accidentally, and he makes intercession for us in heaven. He then goes on, Pope Leo, to conclude, expressing a deep concern about a policy, he calls it a policy, that is being followed. Quote, which has resulted in a wall being raised between the church and civil society. He's not talking about a wall on the southern border. All right? A wall between the church and the civil society. And so what's going on with this wall? It's an effort to exclude religion from having a role in public life. So religion has no role in public life. You always hear the two things you never talk about in polite society. What are they? Religion and politics. What are the two most important things in life? Religion and politics. So why aren't we talking about that? Okay. So that's a real concern for him. The result is that sacred and divine law is disregarded. We're not paying attention to that. So he says, what happens? People, therefore, begin to give themselves up because of this to their passions. And he says, finally, they wear themselves out by an excess of liberty. They're living a dissolute life, whether it be drugs, sex, alcohol, whatever the case might be. 
And so he starts saying, these evils are pressing upon us from every side. But he says, Jesus Christ alone can save us, for there's no other name given to us under heaven by which mankind can be saved. And then he goes on and listen to the, what he's describing here. We have gone astray and must return to the right path. Darkness has enveloped our minds. Hmm. This gloom needs the light of truth. Death has seized us, but we must lay hold of life. Well, I think that sounds like John Paul, right? Death has laid hold of us, the culture of death. Now what's amazing, he's saying this in 1899. 1899. So what was going on then generates and continues on to affect all the things we do. So, he concludes his encyclical writing. Now, this is right at the very beginning of the 20th century. And it's a beautiful text, and I'd like to share it with you. He writes, When the church in the days immediately succeeding her institution was oppressed beneath the yoke of the Caesars, a young emperor saw in the heavens a cross, which became at once the happy omen and cause of the glorious victory that soon followed. And now today, behold, another blessed and heavenly token is offered to our sight, the most sacred heart of Jesus, with a cross rising from it and shining forth with dazzling splendor amidst flames of love. In that sacred heart, all our hope should be placed, and from it, the salvation of men is to be confidently sought. Peace will come only when all men shall acknowledge the empire of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And we talk about all oh, the social problems, the chaos we're experiencing socially. If you're going to forget Christ, if you're going to know Christ, there is no way, there's no path forward to finding the peace we want. Now, he wrote that, but 20th century really in many ways was an age of apostasy. Men did not listen to the voice of the vicar of Christ at the dawn of that century. The beginning of that century witnessed the horrors of World War I, mustard gas, new technologies on how to kill people. You had horrible things where thousands of young men were slaughtered, fighting in trenches, advancing to build a trench 10 yards closer to the enemy and millions of them giving their life in this horrible slaughter that was World War I. 1917, you have the Communist Revolution, which unleashed a form of tyranny, the likes of which the world had never seen before. But let's move forward now to the exact topic, quas primas. The year is 1925. We're in the middle of the Roaring Twenties. The war is over and people are searching for meaning and things are going crazy. You have people writing books, uh, trying to show, and people searching for the meaning and purpose of life. All right. It is at this time that Papa Rate, Pius XI, who was a brilliant scholar, fabulous librarian. He was in charge of the library uh, at the Vatican. And he was also an expert mountain climber, loved to go outside climbing mountains, etc. He issued Quas Primus. And the Holy Father states, right at the beginning of this encyclical, that the evil of secularism has spread so that now a greater part of mankind has, and this is what he says, banished Jesus Christ and his holy law, listen to the order, from their lives, their families, and public affairs. No one makes reference to Jesus anymore in this particular context. So he goes on then and starts to restate the teaching of Leo XIII. He cries out like a prophet of old, there's never going to be peace, lasting peace in our world as long as individuals and nations continue, okay, to deny or refuse to acknowledge the rule of Christ, our Savior. He's our Savior. You know, our faith is not just some kind of subjective truth. It involves objective reality, real events, things that really happened in time and in history. And he again restates that, the, that Christ rules over us by right of birth, because he's the Word, he's God, he's our Creator, and secondly uses this interesting term, by right of conquest by right of conquest. Now, some in our church, when they hear that kind of language, right of conquest, oh, that's military, oh, I don't like that, I'm not really comfortable with that. But we have to remember that he is what? He's a warrior king. He's a warrior. Christ is a fighter, all right? He fights against sin. He fights against death. He fights against error, all right? 
His is a victory of mercy, and it's a mercy which triumphs over hatred, right? Because what does he receive from us? Scourges, right? Nail wounds, beatings, mockery. But he takes all of that, that hatred, that contempt, and that violence, and he swallows it all up in an incredible act of divine mercy. And that's the victory of our redemption. That's why we say he is our redeemer. So he says, Christ has the right of conquest as our redeemer. So it's important to remember that both creation, the creation of the world, and our redemption are both acts of what? They're acts of love. They are acts of love, all right? Our greatest saints, whether you think of Francis and St. Clair, Catherine of Siena, St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure, or more recently, uh, Therese of Lisieux, all saw that. Our great saints saw that. Our greatest Catholic poets saw that creation and redemption are both just incredible acts of love. Nothing really to fear here. The loving God who manifested himself most perfectly in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our King. As the great Irish poet and patriot Joseph Mary Plunkett, one of my favorite poems, he wrote it just before his execution in Comanum Jail in Dublin. I share it with you. It kind of captures this sense of the beauty of that love. He wrote just before his death, I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows. His tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower. The thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice. And carven by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree." End quote. Isn't that beautiful? Secularism doesn't like that, all right? Doesn't like that tone, doesn't like that type of thinking. It's too religious. It is too Catholic. But what are the effects of this secularist thought? Pope Pius XI in this encyclical says there are seven effects. And I'll give them you right now. These are the seven effects because of this hostile secularism. First, Christ's rule over mankind is denied. He has no rule. He has no authority, so there is a rejection of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the, right, the church's right to evangelize is denied. Tax against the church, ability to communicate the gospel message. Third, the Christian religion is made equal to other religions and lowered to their level. It's what we call syncretism. You know, all religions are the same. There's no difference. As long as you're sincere in what you believe, that's all that matters. As if the truth, we can be indifferent to truth. And that's something that has become, unfortunately, very, very common today. The Catholic religion, this is number four, is made subject to the civil power. <laughs> Too bad he didn't experience COVID. All right? Right now in Ireland, the government says you cannot baptize, you can't have communion, you can't have confirmation. No more than 50 people can go to Mass. And they're continuing that. And we need to speak about that. All right? All right. Point number five. There is an effort to substitute a vague natural religion for the truth of the religion of Christ. Sort of a vague humanism. But it's a humanism without Christ would have essentially then becomes anti-human. If you read Robert Hugh Benson's book, The Lord of the World, that's exactly what he says is going to be the antithesis, the great antagonist to Christianity in the final age. Six, he says, governments say you can do without God. And even governments promote irreligion and disrespect for God. That disrespect is something that's good and virtuous. And religious practice is for people who are weak-minded and silly. And lastly, number seven, he says, there is a selfish egotism that is released, that attacks and destroys the family, particularly, weakening the sense of duty, and therefore the unity and stability of society collapse. 
Should I say that again? The unity and the stability of society collapse. Welcome to 2021. That's what we're experiencing. Now to counter this, Pope Pius XI, whose motto was the peace of Christ in the reign of Christ, instituted a special feast honoring the kingship of Christ who reigns through his sacred heart. And on that feast, he asked that everywhere in the Catholic world that there would be a solemn act of consecration made to the royal heart of Christ in a spirit of reparation. John Paul, in his pontificate, said, this has never been abrogated. This is something that still should be done. As a matter of fact, when he visited Poland in 1999, he did that, performed that great solemn act of consecrating the Polish nation to Christ the King in his sacred heart. And this is something we have to remember. He goes on, Pius XI, exhorting the faithful to fight with courage, always under the banner of Christ the King. Don't be embarrassed about it. Speak about his reign. Speak about his kingship. For Christ's empire of love extends over individuals, over homes, and yes, over civil society as well. The Pope teaches that national leaders and their people have to give public testimony of reverence and obedience to the empire of Christ. So on this feast, he asked that families, nations, should manifest special Eucharistic devotion with processions in public streets, okay? Manifesting and acknowledging the kingship of Jesus Christ. I was very pleased to say, oh, some people, well, you can't really do that today. Well, you can. In 2016, I remember saving this article, the president of Peru consecrated the entire nation of Peru to the kingship of Jesus Christ in his sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary. The Polish bishops, along with the president of Poland, also in 2016, consecrated the entire nation of Poland to Christ the King under the title of his sacred heart. So as the shadow of totalitarianism spread across Europe in the 30s, Pius instituted the Feast of Christ the King on the last Sunday of October. That's where the feast was originally, the last Sunday of October. In 1969, St. Paul VI, in response to the rapid spread of this hostile secularism throughout the lands of Christendom, moved it to the last Sunday of the liturgical year. And he renamed it, even more significantly, the Solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, <laughs> King of everything. All right. Now, how do you do something like this? Well, I remember I took a group of Christendom students to Rome and I witnessed something that John Paul did. A lot of people don't even know that he did this. But John Paul II, St. John Paul, brought back the great practice of the papal Eucharistic procession on Corpus Christi. When Pius IX lost the papal states, that thing was suppressed. And so I remember the year he started this up again. And Cardinal Scote, who consecrated our chapel, gave us the, chap the chalice of John Paul. Uh, got us these great seats. We were right at the front of John Lateran Basilica. So imagine this. Some of I know many have been to Rome. John Lateran is the basilica that was given by the Emperor Constantine to Pope Miliciades, a sign that the persecutions had ended. It's a symbol of the triumph of the Christian faith. And in that Baroque splendor, you had Mass celebrated right in front of the basilica. When Mass was over, they had this beautiful carriage set up for John Paul. There was an altar on the carriage and there was a pre -do. John Paul got up and knelt, and then the Blessed Sacrament was placed on that altar in this carriage, all right? And then he kneels, and you know how John Paul would just be immersed in prayer? He falls down in prayer, and then the carriage begins to move. And you've got cardinals, president of Italy, civil officials, the mayor of Rome, everyone is there. And then they start moving down the great street, the Via Merulana which takes you up to the Basilica of Mary Major. And so we're going up there, and they're singing Thomas Aquinas's Pange Lingua Gloriosi. But this is out in the open air, in the public. And as we move down the street, thousands of people are following the Pope. The whole city, every house, every church, has their doors open with the Blessed Sacrament exposed. There's banners everywhere. Christ, his kingship, his Eucharistic lordship is being proclaimed. As you go down, you see this incredible civic manifestation. The Italian military is there. 
And then at the end, when we get in front of the great Basilica of Mary Major, you have benediction. And it comes time for John Paul to bless with the Blessed Sacrament. The Eucharistic King is raised up. Everyone in the piazza, everyone on the Via Marlana hits their knees. And you just see this public manifestation acknowledging the reality of Jesus Christ and his kingship. It was an overwhelming experience. I keep a picture, a photograph of that in my office to remind me of what can be done. And of course, it's very significant to reflect upon the fact that this public acknowledgement uh, that the Pope did was something that he had also done in Poland. You know, he did those Eucharistic processions in the midst of a very hostile communist regime. So, this is something we need to think about. How can we expect public leaders to acknowledge Christ's kingship? <laughs> and we expect anyone in the public arena to do this if we as a church do not acknowledge his kingship publicly, all right? If we are too timid to speak this way, how often do we as Catholics fi fail to evangelize or sometimes pass over in silence speaking the name of Jesus, almost as you have to make an apology for even bringing him up at a cocktail party or in polite society. But to evangelize in our pluralistic age is considered unsophisticated. It's not broad-minded. It is intolerant or sometimes fanatical. I remember just read something by Peter Kreft where he said, that's the new F word in our society. Anyone, anyone who brings up religion or Jesus, that's fanatical. Never be that way. It's the worst thing you could ever be. But it's very interesting. I'll give you a little quote from John Paul the Great. And he says, the civilization, that's a public expression, the civilization of love must rise strongly and vigorously in a people reconciled where hatred and violence and injustice will be no more. A society in which there will always be complete respect for the inalienable rights of the human person and the legitimate freedom of the individual and the family. It is only through a deep reconciliation of each one with God and with all mankind that the much desired harmony will be achieved. The mystery of the Eucharist is no way is in no way alien to the building of a new world. Rather, it is its principle and source of inspiration because the Lord Jesus is the foundation of a new humanity that is reconciled and fraternal." End quote. You know, Fulton Sheen, who I always loved a great deal, once said, America, this is a quote, America is not suffering from intolerance, despite what you hear in the media. It is not. It is suffering from tolerance of right and wrong, truth and error, virtue and evil, Christ and chaos. He goes on, our country is not so much overrun with the bigoted as it's overrun with the broad-minded. All right. All right, and in the face of this so-called broad-mindedness, what the world really needs, he ends, is intolerance. In other words, people who are going to bear witness to the truth. There's a term that Benedict, Pope Benedict used all the time called intellectual charity. To proclaim the truth in love is an incredible act of charity because our minds, our souls are made for truth, and Christ is truth. In 1925, many took Pope Pius XI's encyclical instituting this feast, Sacred Heart, and Christ the King to heart. But there were many who hated that message. They thought it was retrograde and rejected it and criticized the Pope. The rising power of the Nazis in Germany, the communists in Russia, all of them despised this. And that fear and hatred and opposition was crystallized particularly in 1936 during the Spanish Civil War. During six months of 1936, 15 bishops were killed and mutilated in Spain. Cut them up. Such was the hatred of their office. Never in the history of the church had been that many bishops killed in one persecution. 15 bishops, 6,000 priests, 6, priests, seminarians, and nuns were killed in six months. 6,000, all right, were martyred. Bodies of nuns were dug up out of their graves and propped up against the church, shot, mocked, and ridiculed, made fun of. 10,000 churches in Spain were either destroyed or desecrated. Blessed Sacrament, 
taken out of the tabernacle, nailed to walls. Some of those communists ran away because some of those hosts bled. Blood poured out of the hosts when they nailed them to the wall. All right. Probably one of the most disturbing things is the great statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, Christ the King, to whom the Spanish nation had consecrated itself, was so hated that they sent a regiment of communist soldiers out to execute the statue. You know, we may not think that Christ's kingship and Sacred Heart <laughs> is powerful, but the devil does. And he inspires the communists. And there's a photograph of these guys shooting and maiming and destroying the statue of the Sacred Heart, Christ the King, to whom the Spanish nation had consecrated themselves. But what is amazing is all of these martyrs died forgiving their executioners. Before their death, what was their cry? Viva Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey. Kill me, but long live the Christ, Christ the King. One of the more famous martyrs, a priest we know died giving absolution to his executioners. He had raised his hand, said, I forgive you. And he was actually giving them absolution because the bullet went right through his right arm and pierced his heart and killed him. But they saw he died giving absolution, forgiving those who were doing this horrible thing to him. Okay, this is so important to reflect upon. All right, uh, today it's so important, I think, that we recognize more than ever, that there is an authority that is higher than the state. The state does not have the last word. It is not the highest authority. God is the highest authority. St. John Paul in his pontificate canonized over 200 of the martyrs in Spain. Pope Benedict also. Pope Francis has been very strong in canon. He's canonized many Spanish martyrs as well. And the church truly has become, once again, a church of martyrs. And that should not be forgotten. You know, there's a story I heard once I'd, I'd like to share. It was very powerful about a, a woman. It involved a nurse. The woman was mentally ill, struggling. She was violent. And they actually put her in isolation in this mental hospital. And they had a big glass window up in front of that so you could watch to make sure she didn't injure herself or injure somebody else. And there was a nurse just happened to be passing by and looked in and saw her there sitting in this room completely alone and isolated. And so she went in to talk to this woman. And she went in and went up to her and said, is there anything I can do for you? And the woman looked at her and just gave her the most violent, ripping smack across the face, struck her in the face. And the nurse was really upset, of course, shaken, as you can imagine, and turned to walk away and started to leave the room, got to the door, was going out, and then she stopped, looked back, and went back to the woman and then said to her, looking at her eyes, and said, is there anything else that I can do for you? The woman began to weep. And that began to lead to her healing, that someone actually cared about her. And eventually that woman was healed because of that woman taking that, all right? But the point, the reason I bring that up, in many ways, that's the way God is with us, who so loved the world he sent his own son. And when we go to confession, what does he do? He forgives us over and over and over again. We have to remember that when we talk about our king, that our king is a crucified king. He's a king who reigns from a cross. It's not something to be afraid of, all right? It's a sign of hope and love, but it's also a sign that will be opposed. It is, in fact, a sign of contradiction as well. But our Lord said, remember, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And that lifting up on the cross was the beginning of his glorification the beginning of his kingship. And of course, before Pilate, when the Roman procurator asked then, are you a king? Because remember, what did the Jews accuse him of? Being a king. The Jews acknowledged that he was, in fact, claiming to be a king. And if he had said, no, I'm not a king, he probably could have saved his life. But when Pilate asked them, what does he say? Thou hast said it. I am a king. That was his response to Pilate. And what was Pilate's response? He was the first one, first Gentile certainly, to proclaim Jesus Christ as a king. What he put on the cross in Hebrew, Greek, and in Latin. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And that's a messianic title. Remember king of the Jews, messianic title. Pilate proclaims Jesus as the Messiah. That's why the Jews were so upset and objected. Don't say that, say he claimed. And he just simply said, what I have written, what I have written. I think what happened there is Pilate listened to his wife. 
It's always best to listen to your wife. And remember what she said, have nothing to do with that just man, with that righteous man. How did she, a Gentile, know that Jesus of Nazareth was a righteous, good man? Nothing to do with that, all right? But of course, as he mounts his royal throne, what is his first act is in that kingly heart of his, as four red rivers begin to flow in that new paradise? And of course, at the third hour, there's a fifth stream that's going to be open that is the source of all those other four rivers flowing in that paradise with Jesus. He says, Father, forgive them. What an amazing thing. After all that he has suffered, he takes it all, all right? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Again, mercy swallows up evil. Mercy swallows up hatred. It swallows up contempt. That's the limit that is placed on evil in this world. If we talk about that, who could really resist the love of such a king? And of course, he's dying with two other men. The two other men, the two thieves, symbolize humanity. One of the thieves says, take me down, take me down. The other one says what? Take me up, lift me up, give me dignity, all right? And he looks at Jesus and says something, I think, incredible. We don't think about it very often. What does he say? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kingdom? You talk about an act of faith. You're being crucified, all right? You're being crucified. And he's the ecce homo. What's his crown that this man is looking at? It's a mass of bloody thorns wounding his head. What's his scepter? It's a large Roman construction nail that's been driven into his hand. All right, that's the scepter he's holding. His royal garment is, of course, his wounded, lacerated flesh, which would have been covered from wounds and would have turned purple, of course, from the scourging that he enjoyed at the pillar because he enjoyed it because he loves to do this for us. He reveals, though, what's really interesting, but of course, I mean, imagine this guy looking and seeing this and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, he was despised, he was rejected. Uh, who could recognize him as a king? But this man on the cross is given the grace to do that. And listen to how he responds as a king. What does he say? He reveals his royal authority and his incredible love again on the cross. This day... Thou shalt be with me in paradise. See what's going on? He's in charge of his passion. He's in control of his passion. And, of course, wherever Christ is, that's where paradise is going to be. But, of course, we've got to get back to paradise through a flaming sword, right? That's the only way to go back through suffering. And our king was to receive that blow along with his mother, whom he gave to us from the cross as the queen and mother. And she was going to receive the same blow as Simeon had prophesied. Right? The sword can pierce her heart, pierce her soul, just as the soldier's lance of Longinus will pierce our Lord's heart. And that mystical union of those two hearts together. And so as our Lord is hanging on the cross, he sees in the distance, because Calvary was much higher. They took a lot of the soil away when they're looking for the cross. It was much higher. You could see over the walls. You could see the great temple in Jerusalem. And so as he's dying on the cross, he's looking at the temple. And of course, when he dies, that great curtain is rent in two from top to bottom, not bottom to top, but top to bottom, indicating divine action. And the Holy of Holies was laid bare and open for everyone. So on Calvary, the true lamb, the new eternal high priest, the new king had the veil of his flesh torn, or as St. John says, opened. And heaven was opened, and a new holy of holies, not just metaphorically, all right? A new holy of holies really and truly is revealed, his heart. And all of humanity is now invited to enter into that royal sanctuary, which is his heart. And after seeing all these things, remember with the Roman centurion, another Gentile, after hearing all those things that he said on the cross, What's he look up and say, truly, this man was the son of God. All right? Amazing statement, again, from a Gentile. You know, in all our lives, we speak to one another, we give gifts to one another, we have conversations with one another. There's so much we do to try to stay connected with one another. But the last thing we always give, the most precious thing that we guard, and the last thing that we give is our heart. Don't you think that's true? when you really give your heart the core of who you are and what, what's deepest in you as a human being. And that's what our Lord gave us at Calvary. The very last thing that he gave us was his heart, his wounded, open heart saying, 
come to me, come to me, all right? That's why in that last final testimony our dear Lord gave to St. Margaret Mary, and through her tells us into the world, a world that has grown tired, that has grown cold, I want you to once again contemplate, reflect upon my heart. Same thing he said to Sister Faustina, Krakow, all right? He wants us to enter that wounded kingly heart which is so in love with men, yet receives so much coldness and indifference, which is why we need to respond and push back. I'd like to end with a quote from Pope Francis. It's not a quote that you're gonna see in the New York Times or the Washington Post. And a lot of times, some of the most beautiful things that he has said and done never make the press. But this was in his document, Evangeli Gaudi on the, you know, the joy of the gospel. And he writes, and I quote, and I'd like to conclude with this. I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. The Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. Whenever we take a step towards Jesus, we come to realize that he is already there waiting for us with open arms. Isn't that beautiful? He's already there waiting with open arms. So. Let's pledge our loyalty to Christ our King who reigns in his heart. Let's think concretely how we in our lives, in our personal lives, can help build this civilization of love. If we can enthrone the sacred heart, acknowledging the kingship of Christ in our homes, in our families, in our businesses, in our parishes, in our schools, in our colleges, let's do that. That one day our nation and our world will acknowledge Jesus Christ is King. May his kingdom come. Thanks for listening. Thank you.